the world, the world's writers will walk through those gates. And uh, if you hang around, you get a chance to talk to them. I'm interested in conversations that deal with things that matter, but real, you know, how do we live our lives? First of all, make climate change personal in your life. The second step is get angry and get active. And the third step, and believe it or not, I think this is the most important. We have to imagine this world that we want to hurry towards. But kindness is looking at people as people and not as I voted this, I do this, whatever it is. There are some people we will never get along with, but most of us, most of us are a complex mass of different things. My name is Raja Shadi. I've been participating in the Edinburgh International Book Festival for many years. The festival has been central to my development as a writer. The thrill I feel as I enter Charlotte Square has never waned. I could always count on excellent programming and stimulating discussions. There has never been a time when such meetings are more important. Hello and welcome to the Edinburgh International Book Festival, coming to you this year in very different circumstances. Uh, my name is Alan Little, I'm a broadcast journalist and I chair the board of this festival and it's my privilege uh, to introduce you to a writer and a thinker who I've admired for 30 years. But before I do that, I want to introduce you to, uh, to I want to thank uh, some, some people, very important people to this festival, the sponsors and supporters who help to bring this festival to you. We're making it available free of charge, no ticket prize, no ticket income for the festival. So uh, I want to thank in particular the sponsor of this event, the Scottish Mortgage Investment Trust. Um, Anne Applebaum is a historian, a journalist. She's written a regular column for the Washington Post for many years, now writes for The Atlantic. She worked in London for The Spectator. Uh, and she's lived in the United States, the United Kingdom and Poland. She developed an expertise in communist Eastern Europe before the end of the Cold War. She was connected to groups of uh, very brave anti-communist dissidents in those countries. Uh, her book Red Famine about the, 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 the Ukrainian famine in the 1920s won more prizes than I can list here. She was at the festival in person last year with that book. Uh, her book Iron Curtain about the crushing of Eastern Europe in the years after the Second World War was also critically acclaimed. And her book Gulag about the network of, uh, uh, a network of prison camps in the Soviet Union won her the Pulitzer Prize. But this book is probably her most painful, and I imagine, uh, her, most, her most personal, I imagine, the most painful to write. It's called Twilight of Democracy, The Failure of Politics and the Parting of Friends. And welcome back to Edinburgh. It's great to see you. Thank you so much. And I really do wish I was there in person. I love Edinburgh. <laughs> 
Thank you. Let me ask you, you start, you start, you, this, this book is intended as a warning about something that's happening across the democratic world and you start 20 years ago at a period of great optimism with a New Year's Eve party you threw in your house in Poland where you are now uh, to, to friends who were more or less politically aligned with you, British friends, American friends, Polish friends. Uh, I remember where I was that night, I was in Moscow Boris Yeltsin managed to upstage an event that only happens once every thousand years by resigning and naming Vladimir Putin as his uh, successor. Tell me why you wanted to start with that party. I, I started with the party and, and to be clear, I'm not some kind of great hostess. I don't give a lot of parties. It, it's not a book about parties. Um, but I started with the party because I thought a, the party was a good metaphor for a kind of coalition or a group of people who at that time shared a set of ideas or we thought we shared a set of ideas. Um, and it was transnational, it was across Europe and the United States. Um, it very much included Poland as well as America, as well as Scotland. Um, and these were the people who were anti-communists. And um, I mean, they kind of had a different flavor in different countries. In Britain, sometimes they were called Thatcherites. And, in America, they were sometimes Reaganites, and in Poland, they were called Pravica, which means the, the right or the, um, and, and they seemed to be a kind of coherent group. And I began to think about that party 20 years after it happened and realized that many of the people who were there no longer speak to one another. So, and it's not even, it's not even a mild set of disagreements or because everybody's drifted apart, it's actually, active antipathy. I mean, people would cross the street in order to avoid one another. And I thought that, that that fact and that change merited some kind of deeper thought or explanation. And, what, um, and that, really, that really was where I started the book. And was it painful to write? Because one of the characters you put in, that, in the book from that party is a woman you were very close to. You made her the godmother to you, one of your sons, and you don't have a speaking relationship anymore. No, I mean, you know, look, it's hard to compare the writing of this book, which is a kind of short and very subjective book, to the writing of Gulag, which took 10 years and was painful in very different ways. So um, I, I wouldn't say it was so much painful as that it required a lot of, um, you know, it's kind of introspection and explanation. Um, I spent a lot of time trying to think about why my ex-friends might have changed and what had happened to them and what, it, what, what were they disappointed by in the society that was created in Poland after 1989. And that thought actually led me to a similar set of questions about people I know in the UK and people I know in the US um, in the and, early and, part and of, elsewhere. In the early part of the book, you look carefully at Poland and Hungary, but warning us that you don't see, see Poland and Hungary as, as in some way exceptional, that, that, that what, what's happening to the democracies in Poland and Hungary is also happening to varying degrees across the entire democratic world. But just tell me, what did those ex-friends of yours turn into? What sort of politics have they come to project in the world? So as I describe in the book, I mean, so there's a, there are a group of people who I used to know, not all of them were my friends. Um, some of them were just acquaintances, but are people who I was aware of, you know, but but um, they are now part of a, or they're very um, loyal to a, what I would describe as a kind of radical nationalist party. Um, it's a, it's a um, it describes itself as Catholic, although, I mean, I think it's Catholic more as a, as a badge of identity rather than that doesn't express anything about the religiosity of its members or its leaders. Um, it is a, um, it is a, I mean, I would I would say it's an it's a it's a would be authoritarian party. Um, it's a party that considers itself and its members the only rightful rulers of Poland. Um, we are the true patriots. We are true Poles. Everybody else is fake or foreign or elite or degenerate or or, or something along those lines. Um, and it's and it identifies itself as um, you know as as the only party with a kind of right to rule. Um, and the friends of mine who are members of it, or in many cases, not just members, but kind of active propagandists or, or intellectuals associated with it are people who've created its ideas and its public face and, and, and who speak for it. Um, and in, you know, in, in, in Poland, one or two of them are now famous. One is a famous anti-Semite. I mean, he's very open about his 
belief that you know Jews are seeking to undermine Poland and and destroy it. Um, one or two others are um, in, you know are people who've been involved in you know active advocacy for an attack on the independence of the courts or the or the destruction of state media, um, the undermining of Poland. Poland has a you know it, the equivalent of the Polish BBC is now a you know virulent form of party propaganda for the ruling party of a kind that we haven't had in Poland in several decades. I mean, actually communist television in its late years was less aggressive than, than television is now. Um, and so and these are people who formed and created that form of television and that form of propaganda. And as I say, I felt that that needed some kind of explanation. And one of the sort of counterintuitive things that, that has happened is that people who in the 1980s very bravely took a stand against a totalitarian dictatorship have now themselves become part of a, a machinery of government that has come to resemble in some ways what they fought against when they were younger. It does mean they, to be fair, they don't see it that way. Um, they feel themselves to be justified in what they do. But in many ways, yes. I mean, the, their arguments for why the courts need to be politicized sounds like arguments communists could have made. Um, their arguments about why independent media needs to be undermined or destroyed or taken over by, by the state sound very much like arguments communists could have made. And actually, even the way they talk about the outside world and the West is exactly how the communists used to do it. You know, these, these Western... Democrats with their their wily ways and their secret tactics and the secret cabals lined up against us. I mean, that's actually how, I mean, sometimes it's almost word for word, the same kind of language that um, the Polish Communist Party used to used to use to talk about Western Europe. Um, and and they and they seem unbothered by that comparison and unbothered by that similarity. Why do you think the liberal democratic model that they they bought into, they signed up to when they joined the European Union. They had to meet the so-called Copenhagen criteria, after all, about you know media ownership, about independence of the judiciary, and so on. Why do you think they've turned against that, uh, the, the model that was prevalent in the West? So there are different answers for different people. And to be clear, so my book is not a political science tract, and I don't have like a single thesis which I defend or or which I'm trying to. I've, I've I do look at a few particular people and 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 the way their lives have gone, and I, I try and explain it that way. Um, I think the, the unifying theme, and this is true actually across the book and across the different countries that I talk about, the unifying theme is disappointment. Um, in some cases, it's personal disappointment. So in Poland, there's, there's the phenomenon, I describe one example in the book, of people who were dissidents in the 1980s. They led demonstrations or joined demonstrations, and they imagined that they would have great political careers after communism fell, and then it didn't quite work out that way. Or the society that evolved in the 90s and the 2000s wasn't to their liking, or they weren't as successful in it as they had hoped they would be. And so for some people, um, that was that's enough of a reason to seek to smash the system, to create alternatives, to create different kind of politics and a different kind of political party that they can rise in or they can succeed in. Um, for others, there was a sense that um, democracy was, um, you know, weaker than they expected, that it wasn't, it didn't produce the moral society that they'd hoped for. Um, it didn't produce the, you know, one of the, one of the phenomena, you know, when you have free markets um, and when you have competition between companies, um, one, of the, one of the phenomena is that some of the winners of those market competitions aren't necessarily, I don't know, people who are morally admirable or, um, or you know, patriotic in the way that you define patriotism. Um, and some of them you know, didn't necessarily like who came out on top um, after 20 years. And so they wanted to reverse the system. Um, there's another element which is implicit in your question, which is that, of course, um, in the 1990s and 2000s, Many of the, you know, there was a there was a sense in which democracy in these countries was top down, and that it was an elite project designed by people who very much wanted to be part of Europe and part of the West. Um, you know, you know, and I, although I, I should say I think a little bit too much has been made of that argument. For one, I mean, I think all democracies begin that way, um, and secondly. Polls voted, and and you know the same is true in other countries. Over and over again, you know, participated in elections, voted for pro-democracy parties, um, chose to 
you know, the, um, and in particular, the choice to join Europe or the choice to join the European Union was, I mean, just overwhelmingly popular um, in, in, in most of these countries. It had, when, when referendums were held, they got results of, you know, 80%, 90% in favor. Um, so, so although there was an element of, you know, these new systems being designed by intellectuals and, and people, um, and people with education, it is also true that people voted for them. So but that's a... But one of the characters in your books points out the, 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 the difference as he sees it between democracy as it evolved in, in what we used to call Western Europe was that it evolved over many decades of trial and error and struggle. Whereas in Eastern Europe, at the, the fall of, com of communism in 1989, the European Union said, OK, here's the blueprint. This is what you must do. This is, what must you, this is the kind of judiciary you have to have. This is the kind of media ownership laws you have to have. This is the kind of citizenship law. This is the kind of economy. So it's easy now for those, th that, that authoritarianism that's, that's been emerging to say this, this was a, a code that was a policy that was written for us by foreigners and we've discovered that it's incompatible with, with our own national values. So to, again, to be clear, those, those ideas were widely accepted in the 90s and 2000s. Um, so there wasn't a big movement against them at the time. Um, and also to be clear, the people who are saying that now also find it useful to say that because these anti-democratic or anti-pluralist um, or illiberal movements have offered them opportunities and, and advancement. So it's a, you know, that's a, that's a complicated issue to pick apart. But, but um, you know, it's also true that people who choose to feel patronized by the West or choose to feel um, that they're somehow not part of the West, um, you know, have, have made that argument, um, uh, you know, more, more than once. Um, but very often it's, it's important to understand what their motivations are too. Let me ask you about um, the plane crash, the Smolensk plane crash that was taking, uh, it's in 2011, I think, was taking the um, uh, many members of the government of the day and top brass of the army to a commemoration in Russia of the murder of the officer corps of the Polish army by Soviet uh, troops during the Second World War. And the plane crashed, killing everybody on board. Now, your husband, Radek Sikorsky, was uh, served as the foreign minister in the previous government, the old centre-right government led by Donald Tusk. He, he was in power at the time of the plane crash. I mean, he was the, he was the foreign minister at that and time. And what I hadn't realised until I read your book was that he had to break the news to the president's twin brother that the, 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 the plane had crashed. Why, why yes, wasn't Radek on the, on the plane itself? Why was he not on board? Uh, he was invited to be on board. Um, it's, that's, that's a longer and deeper story, but he, he, for a variety of reasons, decided not to join the flight. He, he didn't have a great relationship with, that, with the president. The president came from the Law and Justice Party. This is the nationalist current ruling party. He came from another party, and he decided not to be on the plane, not to, not to go on that trip. Um, although he reckons, and I think between the two of us, we knew everybody on the plane. I mean, up to and including the stewardesses and the, and the security guards. So a hugely traumatic event for you personally, but more especially yes. for Poland. How did it change Poland? One of the oddities of that event, and this is a, is that when it first happened in the first few days, it felt like it would be a unifying event. I mean, think of, think of 9-11 in the United States. You know, it felt like um, everyone was mourning together. Um, people were really, um, you know, overwhelmed by it. I mean, in fact, there were all kinds of people on the plane. There were members of all political parties. It was a, there was a parliamentary delegation that had people from all over society. Um, and it felt like it would be a unifying moment. And even the, even the Russian government made a big, some big gestures to Poland, uh, you know, at that time. And the, you know, the then Russian, uh, Dmitry Medvedev came to the, came to the funeral of the president and the, that the, the 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 Russian government showed on on national television um, a film called Katyn, which has never before since been shown in Russia, which is a movie about the Katyn massacre that very clearly blames the Soviet Union, um, and it felt like it would be a unifying moment. Um, but unfortunately, as time went on, it began to have the opposite effect, and the president's brother, the one who remained alive and who's the party leader. Um, Either because he himself couldn't accept the way that the, the, what the what the investigation showed about the crash, namely that it was an accident, possibly and actually probably 
caused by the fact that the president was anxious to land early and on time and put some pressure on the pilots to land, even though the conditions were bad, either because he couldn't accept it or because he began to sense the political possibilities of hinting that there had been a conspiracy. And he began a massive conspiracy theory based campaign to say that there was a, and it's never really been clear what happened. Maybe it was the fault of the Polish government, the one, the, the government run by the opposite opposition party. Maybe it was the Russians, maybe it was some kind of secret plot. Um, there was actually a movie made um, that they, they rallied around and showed showing some kind of explosion on the plane. There have been hundreds of articles saying there was an explosion. You know, so they, they, they insinuated this idea into Polish culture that it was a, some kind of plot and some kind of conspiracy, it's um, which quite, quite a lot of people I know believed, um, including the, one of some of the people that we spoke about already. Um, and, you know, Think about what that means. I mean, if it was true that there was this huge conspiracy to murder the president and it was then covered up by the government and covered up by the police and the secret service and the, and the army and everybody else, then that means that all of, you know, then, then that feeds an enormous amount of doubt about society. I mean, if you can believe in that, that there was a vast cover up, then you might well begin to doubt the the, the, the worth and the value and the patriotism of all the people who work for the state. And it was that, that radical doubt that Kaczynski, this is his name of, of the party leader, brought into Poland. Very, very similar process to the one that Donald Trump used, but when he promoted birtherism in the United States. Again, this idea that Obama was not a real president, that he was a illegitimate. And you know, again, if you believe that, then you have to believe that all kinds of people, Congress, the courts, everybody, is covering up the illegitimacy of the president of the United States. And once you believe that, then you're really prepared to believe all kinds of things about your country. That is what the, the story of the Smolensk uh, plane crash reveals. You say anyone who professes belief in the Smolensk lie is by definition a true patriot, according to that way of thinking. But what it reveals is the way in which conspiracy theory has, be, has become weaponized in pursuit of this authoritarian uh, agenda. Now, I've spent my life as a journalist, and it's been that entire, all, all my life's work, like yours, has been predicated on the assumption that there is something called the truth, and that it's knowable, and that it can be found out and transmitted by trustworthy news sources or academics or whoever to a public that wants to know the truth. Well, the ground has been taken, I, well, I feel as a journalist that the ground, ground is, is crumbling beneath my feet, because increasingly, there are large sections of the public who don't want the truth or don't want to believe that there is any such thing as the truth or that there's any such thing as an accident. And what you do with great skill and clarity in this book is show that that's something that's now a characteristic not just of Poland and Hungary, but of all of the democratic world. How, how dangerous is that, do you think, to the maintenance of, of a democratic polity? Oh, it's profoundly dangerous. I mean, you know, one of the you know, one of the elements of our democracies that I think we've underestimated is that they operate almost on the assumption that there is some truth or some reality that can be discussed and debated and that, you know, reasonable people can have different views about, I don't know, how we fund healthcare, okay? And we can have a reasonable conversation about it and we can use facts and arguments and come up with a solution that you know, either one side wins or the other, or we find some kind of compromise, and that's what democratic politics does. If we are, um, if we, if that's not true, and there isn't a reality to be discovered or discussed, and all that matters is what one group believes versus what one another group believes, and there is no, and there is no shared public space and no shared set of facts, then it becomes very hard to see how democracy operates because. If we can't have that conversation and we can't, you know, fight over, you know, we can't argue in a civilized way. And if if believing or not believing whether something happened makes you a patriot or a traitor, um, then then the whole the, the democratic project begins to look very weak indeed. And this has happened very visibly in the country of your birth, the United States now, where it's very easy if you're confronted with a piece of evidence that contradicts your worldview, you say it's it's been made up. It's been made up by the elites or it's been made up by the other side. Right. And, and then, of course, the problem is that there is quite a lot that's been made up that's kicking around. Um, and so um, what's happened is that people live in, in, in effectively in different communities and 
each of the community depends on a different version of truth or um, and is reliant on different sources that it trusts for that version of truth. And they have now come to be quite different. So what you believe if you're in the, you know, the Fox News, QAnon, you know, bubble is one set of, you know, ideas and facts. And what you believe if you're in the MSNBC, CNN, um, you, know, you know, bubble is quite a different set of facts. And when you have facts that are that different, as I say, the, the nature of debate itself becomes difficult. And this is a, a, a technique, if you like, or a technique of manipulation that's most uh, developed in, in Russia, arguably, where the Kremlin never seeks to deny anything. Instead, it floods uh, the public space with alternative theories so that there's just a cacophony. You, again, you describe this very well. You use that word cacophony and a noise where it becomes an in. There's, a, there's a, a quite a well-known book by Peter Pomerantsov that you'll know called Nothing is True and Everything is Possible. And, and the public just, they, they come to believe that it's impossible to believe anything. Yes, uh, Peter and I actually worked together on a, we worked together on several projects that look at and analyze disinformation. Um, so, so of course I know that book. Yes, no, so, so what, one of the techniques that authoritarian leaders and dictators have used actually, I mean, it's not even a recent or new technique, um, is to put out such a wide range of information, you know, so many, false stories that people cease to believe anything. Um, and this is, as, as you say, I mean, this is, for example, when the, um, the Malaysian plane um, carrying, you know, took off from Amsterdam, that took off from Amsterdam, crashed in, in Eastern Ukraine in 2014. Um, and as it, as it would turn out, it was shot down by, in fact, regular Russian army soldiers who thought it was a Ukrainian plane. Um, when that happened, the Kremlin didn't simply say, um, we didn't do it. Um, they put out a dozen different stories, nutty stories, you know, about why, what had happened and why. And that led people to think, well, n it's not just that we don't know what happened. We will never know what happened. It's impossible to know what happened. It's a, it's a complete mystery and a blank. And once you have people saying that, once we can't believe anything or we can't know anything, um, then you have, you know, the path open for um, you know, for 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 a kind of dictatorship, because then you know anybody anybody can claim to be to can know the truth, and anybody can be in charge. I want to move on because I want to get you onto the the subject of what's happening in America, because it's a very it's a very key time now. But first of all, you you talk uh, very interestingly about what led to the Brexit vote, and you, in a way, you're the perfect observer of this because you were very close to the people who turned into the leading lights of the Brexit campaign in the 1990s when you worked on The Spectator. You knew Boris Johnson uh, when he was uh, in, in Brussels. And that theme of disappointment emerges from your book to connect the Brexit vote to what is happening uh, in, in Poland and Hungary too. You said, you say, um, I'm going to quote a paragraph from, from uh, your book. You say, more recently I've come to suspect that democracy in quotes, at least as an international cause, was far less important to a ki certain kind of nostalgic conservative than the maintenance of a world order in which England continued to play a privileged role, a world in which England is not just an ordinary middle-sized power like France or Germany, a world in which England is special and perhaps even superior. That was part of why some of the nostalgic conservatives were so suspicious of the single market, the European single market, that Britain did so much to create. Now, I notice you were very careful in your use of England and Britain. You're not using those terms uh, as though they're interchangeable. You very, you very specifically mean England. But it reminded me of that line from Tinker Taylor, Soldier Spy, where La Carrie has a, a character saying of the post-war British security establishment in the 60s, poor loves, trained to empire, trained to rule the waves, all gone, all taken away, bye-bye world. Does that, does that ring a bell with you? It is. I mean, that's, of course, a sentiment from a slightly earlier era. Um, and, you know, it, it, I would say it certainly seemed by the 1980s and 1990s that, that the British had kind of had found their role in the world, in fact, and that, that you know, despair and, you know, confusion of the 1950s, 40s and 50s was, was gone. Um, and one of the things that really attracted me to Britain and even to the Tory party in the 1990s was that sort of expansiveness and that sense of, you know, our values, our democratic values, um, we can share those with the world, we wanna share them with the world. 
uh, you know, Britain played such an important role in, you know, both in the argument, in the, in the anti-communist argument, you know, but also um, in opening up Eastern Europe to Western Europe after the way that Britain was the country that pushed, one of the countries that pushed the hardest to expand the European Union to include Eastern Europe. Um, and that kind of generosity of spirit and that openness and that, that role that Britain was playing was so, you know, appealed to me so much. And it was one of the reasons why I was, why I stayed in the UK and why I felt attached to the, to the Tory party as it then was. Um, and, you know, I, I also had to reflect in the, in the light of the Brexit vote, in the light of the way it's, and that's another, by the way, another vote that split my friends, probably not as harshly as the, as the, you know, not as deeply as the way the Polish right split, because somehow Brexit is a less existential issue than, you know, than, than is our country a democracy or not. Um, but it did have that same polarizing effect on people. And I, I found at that time I had to look back and ask myself whether, um, whether the, you know, the people who'd been promoting that global British, you know, that, that kind of global democratic liberal, you know, vision of, Brit of, of Britain in the world, you know, whether what they really wanted wasn't something different, which was just influence and importance and specialness and a special role, you know, whatever we're calling it now, the special relationship with the United States or a special significance for, for England in the world. And that once that, you know, and as they began to see that that wasn't quite what they were getting, they became disillusioned with it. Um, but let me ask you about let me ask you about the people who voted for this because more than half the country more than half the united kingdom voted for brexit more than half the polls vote for law and justice and the, a, a large proportion of that vote comes from the people who are often described as the left behind communities the people for whom the reforms that the, the, your tory party and your republican party in the united states uh, uh, pioneered in the 1980s and 1990s. Uh, do you think the, 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 your part of the political spectrum carries some responsibility for, for not, not foreseeing that a rising tide was not going to lift all boats, that wealth would not trickle down? Because the governing assumption was as long as aggregate wealth is growing, everybody will eventually benefit. Well, it's not true. Large parts of society in both the United Kingdom and the United States were left behind by the, 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 the Thatcher and Reagan uh, economic revolution of the 1980s. And it was from those communities that support for Trump emerged and support for Brexit emerged. Yeah, so first of all, I mean, you're, to, to parse your question, yes, of course you're right. Um, and not, you know, not enough time was spent thinking about, for example, what would be the effects on communities of globalization? How do we mitigate those effects? Um, when factories leave the country, what happens to the people who lose their jobs? I mean, you're absolutely right about that, and I, I, I agree. I don't agree that those are the only communities who are responsible for, for the Brexit vote or for the Trump vote. Um, in fact, in the United States, the poorest Americans did not vote for Trump, um, and quite a lot of wealthy Americans did. And the same is true uh, you know, in, in the case of Brexit. In fact, I know, you know there were... There were you know, many middle class, upper class, and extremely wealthy people who were pro-Brexit. Um, and the, I, I always thought that was a mischaracterization of what had happened um, uh, it, it, during that vote. You know, the idea that it was some kind of working class revolution was something that I think made up by, um, you know, by, I don't know, guilty intellectuals in London. Whereas in fact, quite a lot of middle class people, quite a lot of well-off people voted for it. And, and the reasons why they did so were just as much cultural as economic. And so I think that the, the other question that has to be, aside from the economic questions and people, people being left behind, the other question is were people culturally left behind or was, was, um, was the, a, a kind of globalized vision of the world embraced too quickly um, and did it therefore forget some of the, some other values or other things that people care about or um, you know, or, or or did it create you know too much demographic change, too much political change, um, and people weren't really re willing to accept that? I mean, one of the things that always struck me about London um, in the '90s and 2000s, and I remember having a conversation with a friend of mine about it, was how how London had become this international capital and with full of you know I don't know oligarchs and even kleptocrats from all over the world, um, so much so that the traditional British elite was actually priced out of it. Um, and you know, people who lived in the, you know, in the home counties who might have once kept flats in, 
in London couldn't afford to do so anymore. And I remember joking about it saying, well, you know, at some point there's gotta be a revolt of these elites against this, against their capital. Um, and there was, and that was, in my view, that's also what the Brexit vote was. Um, it was a kind of statement that we don't, we don't like our capital city being taken over by, by people who aren't British. Um, so there's a, you know, there were, there were a lot of things going on and the, the oversimplistic vision of it as, as a, as a poor versus rich story, which is easy and, you know, kind of, I don't know, almost like, it's an easy caricature to, to, to offer to people, I think never quite captured what, what happened. You do describe in your book uh, what you just what, what you say is a, I can't remember the exact expression. It's not an author authoritarian personality, but uh, a, a, an authoritarian predisposition. And you characterise people who are inclined to vote for authoritarian figures as people who are suspicious of complexity, people who are suspicious of plurality, and who want certainty. But what, one of the things that uh, I spent a lot of time travelling the UK and indeed uh, the United States. In, the, in places that voted for Brexit and places that voted for, for, for Trump, and indeed in France and Hungary. And what's said, what, what they've all got in common is you meet people who say, I don't recognize my country anymore. I, th I believe my country is changing too fast and in a way that excludes me, and I'm frightened. So, I mean, that, I think you put your finger on it. So um, it's the dislike of what's what one's country has become, you know, whether that's demographic, whether it's economic, whether it's cultural, whether it's moral in some cases, um, the, the feeling that things are changing too fast and you know, this has to stop. And when this, when this feeling, which I describe in the book, and there's, it's got lots of historical antecedents, um, uh, which I you know, the, describe as a kind of cultural despair, when this feeling becomes too strong um, and deepens into something really dark, you know, kind of pessimism or, um, feeling of, um, you know, the, of, uh, that all is lost, that is then the gateway to radicalism. So if you really dislike what has happened in your country and you think that it is, you know, irretrievably changed and it cannot be revived and, you know, then you become open to the idea that what we really need is to smash up the system and we need to destroy it and disrupt it and undermine it and in some cases replace it with something completely different. Um, and whether that's an authoritarian regime or a regime run according to different rules or, or whether we're going to remove all the judges or we're going to destroy them. You know, it, th this, is the, this is the gateway to, to, to radical rules. And it's actually a, a sentiment that you can find in history in other societies where there has also been really rapid change, modernization, industrialization, um, demographic change has, very, has often in the past sparked or inspired this similar kind of feeling. The chapter that deals m most fully with the United States is called Prairie Fire. Just explain why you've chosen that chapter, chapter heading. So Prairie Fire, um, some, some people find this controversial. Prairie Fire is, a, is the name of an essay that was written by a very extreme part of the American far left um, in the 1960s. And this was the one part of the American far left that became violent. Um, and, the, and the reason why, um, well, there were several reasons why I, I wanted to write about it. One was some of the language that, is that was used by the extreme far left um, is now strikingly similar to the language that's used by the extreme far right. You know, and it's about um, a needing to smash up, you, you know, America, you know, grave doubt in America's role abroad. Um, and and one of the, the one of the perhaps circumstantial but nevertheless interesting links is that Steve Bannon has, who is one of the original ideologists of the of of, of Trump, although I don't think Trump ever listened to him particularly. But um, one of his he's used, he's quoted from the Prairie Fire the Prairie Fire essay comes from a Bob Dylan song called Prairie Fire, and and um, which quotes the words Prairie Fire, and Steve Bannon has quoted from that song, and in a way that suggests that he knows where this comes from. The book's very eloquent on what happened to the Republican Party between Reagan and Trump. Reagan, you say, Reagan Republicans venerated the Constitution, which is in a mainstream, centrist American tradition. Trump's uh, Republican Party has abandoned veneration for the Constitution in favor of something else. What do you mean by that? I mean, it's, it's even deeper than that. I mean, the Reagan represented a kind of optimism about America, which contrasts so sharply with the pessimism that Trump represents that 
um, there's a there's a group of um, you know there's a, there's a group of anti-Trump Republicans who've even successfully made a I think one of the most watched campaign ads of the current season is a parody of a famous there's a famous Reagan ad called Mor Morning in America, and they rechange it to morning in America as in mourning for the dead rather than morning as in waking up in the morning. Um, and they, they, they did a parody of the Reagan ad, which is very striking and which had immediately millions of views. And, and you know, just because the contrast between Reagan's America and Trump's America and his way of seeing the world is, is so sharp. I mean, I would argue that what Trump actually represents um, isn't isn't an ideology at all. It's a. It's about um, his personal interests, his family interests. Um, you know, the, the party has become the face of a kind of American kleptocracy. You know, a sort of American version of the Russian oligarchs. Um, you know, it's a party that exists to channel money to and help the interests of its supporters. You know, it's 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 major donors, um, and Trump himself has made it clear that he will use American institutions and, and taxpayers' money in his own personal interests with no qualms or doubts whatsoever. I mean, the most famous example of this is the, is the um, incident that got him impeached, which was when he used American military aid for a foreign country, for Ukraine, as a form of blackmail. And he to, you know, told a foreign leader that he wanted, that in order to get this money, um, he would have to launch a fake investigation of Joe Biden, of his political rival. And that's that's a kind of behavior that has really no precedent in recent American history, no precedent actually that I can think of at all. Um, and so it's a kind of, it's not even, the, the ideology of the Trump administration is not even the one that it ran the 2016 campaign on, this kind of fake right-wing populism. It's actually the, the real ideology is kind of Trump first, Trump's family first, our donors first. Um, it's a kind of, it's, it's politics as a, as a kind of instrumentalist, transactional um, set of exercises decided, you know, created to benefit a few people. But the thing that's, that comes out of your book as well, the thing that, that, that has always intrigued me about the, the American tradition and uh, which I've always admired on my trips to America, both for leisure and for work, uh, it goes right back to the 18th century. What distinguished the American Republic from the word go was that it wasn't like most European states founded around a tribe or a, uh, of a, an, eth an ethnicity or a linguistic group, France being the state of the French people and so on, but it was founded around an idea or an ideal, the values of the 18th century enlightenment translated into a revolutionary new way of governing society or people governing themselves. Um, and you see that venerated all the time. Fourth of July, you see that tradition venerated every year on the Fourth of July. People being very sober and uh, uh, reverent towards the idea of the Constitution. With the Trump Republicans, it does seem, and you argue this in the book, that it's become something much more ethnic. Yes, I mean, actually, the columnist George Will um, has written in, he, and he wrote this in the context of something he wrote about my book, he's written that in some ways the Trump Republican Party represents the sort of Europeanization of the Republican Party. It looks much more like a European far right party than it ever did before in its history. And it has really ceased even to try very hard to create a, you know, a, a, you know to create a message that will appeal to black Americans, to Hispanic Americans. You know, it's very much focused on energizing its base and on, um, you know, and on trying to win through cheating, through gerrymandering, through damaging the post office so that people can't send in ballots. Um, it's become a much different kind of political party and increasingly looks like it, you know, will wind up as a minority party, which is dangerous because I think if it, if it decides, if the party decides that it can't win democratically, then it will try and win undemocratically. And I mean, I think we're seeing evidence of that right now in the, in the current campaign. But again, if you go with that argument, the great counterintuitive conclusion you must draw is that the party that stands for America first and make America a great again is actually, in that sense, profoundly un-American in, in, in the, 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 the base from which it makes its appeal. It breaks from uh, the American tradition. I, 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 I mean, I believe that very deeply. I've become, trying to, I've become wary of this. I, I, I'm guilty of this, too, of talking about things being un-American. Um, and I don't want to accuse Americans of being un-American because that's, you know, that's the, that's where 
you know, that's the direction that polarization leads when you, you know, when you disqualify your enemies because you, you, you know, you say they don't, you know, they don't count or their, their, their views can't be heard. So I try, I'm now trying belatedly not to use that kind of language, but it is certainly, you can certainly say that it's something well outside of any American tradition you know, as we've known it for 100 years. And I'm going to take some uh, questions from the audience now. We've got about 15 minutes to go. Acacia asks, hello, Anne, can you expand on the link between the authoritarian predispositions and the way people may respond to any threat made up or real, like, for example, coronavirus? And what role here uh, does fear play or letting go of freedom? The idea of authoritarian predisposition is something I borrowed from a kind of behavioral psychologist called Karen Stenner, um, who's written about it extensively and has, has done the research that, that backs it up. And she, she argues and has proved really that some people have what she calls an authoritarian predisposition. Doesn't mean it's not quite the same as an authoritarian personality. I mean, it's a, it's a tendency rather than a static quality. Um, and she argues that some people are much more prone to be upset or afraid by scenes of division, by cacophony, by, um, by, by rapid change. Or by, and that, by disagreement. And even by disagreement. And that there are some people who are therefore much more likely to welcome the crackdown, you know, the, 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 the appearance of the police, you know, the moment when when order is restored by some forcible manner. Um, and, you know, I, I mean, frankly, a lot of the, um, a lot of the messaging and, and, and images that are being shown by the Trump administration itself during the campaign are clearly designed to reach those kinds of people. I mean, the, the images of, you know, you know the, 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 the strange um, federal troops who were sent to Portland, Oregon to put down riots in a very, it was a very, very odd moment. Um, it's clear that those, you know, the images from that moment are being used to, um, you know, being broadcast and repeated in order to scare people and make them want to, um, you know, make them want some someone to come to power who will just make everything quiet and shut up and safe. Um, um, I mean, the coronavirus is a slightly, slightly different story. I mean, it is true that when people are afraid and when they're worried about death, which is what the pandemic does, um, they are willing to trade freedom for safety. And people have done that for, for many centuries. Um, although I think that as the coronavirus pandemic goes on and we're learning slightly different lessons from it, namely that a public health crisis also requires some sense of public trust, some sense of competence, some um, you know, the, the, the countries that are succeeding are the ones where there are leaders who rely on science and who are then able to transmit scientific recommendations in a way that, that people trust. And that turns out to be leaders like Angela Merkel of Germany or the leaders of South Korea or Taiwan. Um, and actually the United States and Bolsonaro's Brazil are doing rather badly by contrast. Are you, so the uh, are you lessons of the coronavirus are still to be learned, I think. Are you alarmed by the, the way the coronavirus is interpreted in the United States with so many people unwilling to accept the validity of the science? So the United States is, I mean, this is where we see the real danger that polarization can create. You know, we now have a society so polarized that people have politicized the wearing of masks. Um, you know, um, I, I mean, wearing a mask, I mean, you know, there might be an, a medical or scientific argument about whether it works or not. But, you know, once the medical consensus is that it's useful and that it has a, a chance of slowing the transmission of the virus, it should be a kind of no brainer. I mean, OK, if you have to wear a mask, then you wear a mask. It shouldn't, you know, right wing people can wear masks and left wing people can wear masks. I mean, who cares? Um, but in the United States, um, the the, 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 the you know, forces on, on, particularly on the far right and on the, you know, the kind of conspiratorial right have politicized that as, a, as, a, um, you know, as another way of increasing doubt in, in national institutions. And it does now seem to be an indicator. If you wear a mask, you're likely to be a Democrat or left-leaning. And if you, if you don't wear a mask, you're likely to be uh, right-leaning. It's extraordinary. Right. I mean, I mean that, it's absolutely absurd. I mean, there is a touch of that actually in other countries too. I mean, I know there's a little fringe of that in the UK, and there's a there's a bit of it in some other countries. It's not totally unique to the United States, but but it's worse in the US than it is in any other country I'm aware of. Any other, certainly any other democracy. 
Uh, I've got a question from Sue Reed. In your book, you distinguish between different kinds of nostalgia, conservative nostalgia. How does nostalgia most powerfully form political action? So you have those two distinct forms of nostalgia, one of which the most interesting, well, the more interesting one to me is, is when, you, when you start talking about so-called restorative nostalgia. Can you explain what you mean by that? So there's reflexive nostalgia. This, this is, again, this is an idea I borrowed from a Russian thinker called Svetlana Boim. And there's the idea of reflexive nostalgia, which is, you know, people who like old churches and albums with, you know, with yellowed pages. Um, um, and then there's restorative nostalgia, which is people who look at the past not as something to be examined or thought about or take lessons taken from, who actually want it back um, and who want to take the past and or what they imagine to be the past and reconstruct it and bring it back in real life. Um, and this, there's an element of that um, on the Brexiteer right in England. There's an element of that in Trumpism. Um, and there is, um, there's certainly an element of it in, in, in the, on the Polish right as well. You know, this idea that some idealized vision of what the world used to be like can and should be brought back. And this is really what most nationalist projects are based on is some idealized memory of the past and some program or project to reestablish it in the present. And since we're here in Edinburgh, let me ask you about why you distinguish so carefully between England and Britain, because in Scotland here, we're, we've got used over many years to hearing commentators from overseas use England and Britain as though they're interchangeable, as though they're the same thing. What do you understand about the difference, especially in the context of, of Brexit? I mean, you know, Britishness, it seems to me, is intrinsically, um, it's, it, you know, it's intrinsically more outward looking. It's intrinsically has a broader and more generous definition of citizenship. And this is one of the interesting things about Britain. And I think is one of the things that does make Britain a little bit different from say, you know, Germany, is that the definition of Britishness is, has to be, is not ethnic. It's not, you know, you're part of the English tribe or the Welsh tribe or the Scottish tribe, you know, you're British. You're part of a sort of something slightly broader and more generous. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I think it's been possible to extend Britishness to others. You know, you can be kind of Jamaican and British, you know, um, whereas you can't really be Jamaican and English. Um, it's just, it's kind of, it's, it, it's, it's a contradiction in terms. Um, and one of the things I worry about in, in, in Britain is that the, 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 the proponents of English nationalism, and, and you'll have to tell me whether this is true of the proponents of Scottish nationalism or not. I don't know it as well and haven't, worked, haven't lived or worked in, in Scotland. You know, one of the, one of the dangers is, is, that, is that those forms of ethnic nationalism, you know, narrow down the possibilities of who can be a member of the nation and who can't. Um, and, you know, again, you know, Brit Britishness is, is, is wide and open and has a tradition of being linked to the world. Um, Englishness doesn't. Well, one of the interesting things that's been happening here since the Brexit vote is and support for independence, Scottish independence is now polling at 54, 53, 54 percent in a sustained way, really for the first time in history. And one of the one of the cephalogical things that's happening is that many people who voted no to independence in 2014 and yes to staying in the European Union in 2016 have crossed because they see that the best way of promoting the values that you promote in the world, actually, the values of, of constitutionalism, of liberal democracy, of openness, that, that many, some people, enough to tip the balance over 50 percent, are seeing that the independence project represents a more positive link with European neighbours, I'm paraphrasing here and attributing views to, to, to others, this is not my view necessarily, um, but th there, is, there is that, and John, John, Professor John Curtis, the sophologist, recognises this very clearly. That is what is, is putting the, the pro-independence vote, the, po the polls, over 50%, because people who, want to, who, people who don't want to go down the authoritarian nationalistic path see that the best way of doing that is in an independent Scotland in, a, in some kind of alliance with uh, northern European states across the North Sea. So again, that may be counterintuitive to you. No, I mean I understand that very well, actually. Um, uh, you know, and I, I uh, you know, and, and in fact, it was one of the things that most worried me about Brexit, and which I asked a lot of people about and wrote about myself during the. Um, during the Brexit campaign was, aren't you worried about Scotland? You know, aren't you worried about Northern Ireland? You know, aren't you worried what will happen, um, you know, more broadly to the, to, to the United Kingdom after this? Because it's, you know, there is no majority for Brexit in Scotland. Um, uh, 
And obviously, the you know we don't have to go through once again what the consequences for Northern Ireland will be and how complicated they are, because I think we've all heard quite a lot about that. And I just couldn't get any of my Brexiteer friends to take it seriously. They brushed it away. Oh, you know, don't worry about Scotland. We just won't let them vote again. It was, was the kind of that that was the kind of attitude. Um, and the and the, the the movement that you described of people who were pro-union but pro-European switching sides um, is exactly the thing I was afraid of, and I'm not worried. You know, I'm not I'm not surprised by it at all. There's a question here from Suzanne. What is for you as a very broad question, Anne? What is for you as a writer the most important things to consider when you write about history and historical events? Ah, that's a really interesting question. Um, so in most of my history books, what I've, what I've thought about the most is how to present something from different angles. So how did this, whatever it was, the history of the Gulag, how did it look from the point of view of the authorities? How did it look from the point of view of the guards? How did the prisoners see it? Um, you know, I try to get at the truth of what happened by looking at something from different angles. Um, and actually, this book, the one we're talking about now, is exactly the opposite of that. It is a completely subjective book. It's kind of, here's my view of things that I experienced and that I've thought about, you know, over the last um, 20 years ago. And it has, and I think the book therefore has a very different kind of status. And I expected some people to dislike it a lot and some people to dispute it or, you know, or question it because it doesn't offer a, you know, an objective an objective perspective. So, I mean, I would say the the thing I think about the most is what's the whose perspective am I speaking from? You know, whose views am I showing? You know, um, how, you know how how do I sh you know what's the what's the what's the right angle for this story? And as I said, for this for this particular story, you know, the question of really what happened to the center right over the last twenty years, I felt that the only way to write it was from my perspective since I lived through it. Um, maybe in 20 years, somebody will write it better from a more objective historical perspective. We've got a couple of minutes left. I want to get you back to the United States. Uh, the book is called Twilight of Democracy. Uh, there is some alarming stuff in there. You say it's, uh, there's a strong possibility that we may be living through the last days of, of our democracies, that democracies have in the past uh, contained the seeds of their own destruction. Uh, but you end on, a, on an optimistic note. Uh, given, given that, uh, do you think we're living through the last days of an American-led alliance of democratic countries, the last days of the coalition of, in the democratic world that was put together by Franklin Roosevelt and Harry Truman at the end of the Second World War? Uh, and if, and uh, if, if we are in transition from that world that you and I have lived our entire lives in, what may we be in transition to? And how important is the forthcoming American election in that context? Okay, so that was unfair. That was about four questions, yeah. and I have two Choose left. whichever one you want to answer. <laughs> so first of all, I would say, I would start by saying, I, I've concluded that it's irresponsible to be a pessimist because people in our generation, it's fine for us to say everything's terrible, but we owe it to people who are younger than us to give them the possibility of, of changing things and, and, and restoring things and fixing them. So I don't want to say we're at the end of anything. Um, but I, I do hope that people who aren't American are beginning to prepare for a post-American world or a world in which America is very self-focused um, and are beginning to think about how to reconstitute and how to reform um, inter the international institutions of democracy. So the security institutions, the economic institutions, um, so that they fit the new world and so that um, we will be able to push back against different forms of authoritarianism coming from China, coming from Russia, um, coming from inside of our own countries um, um, over the next several years, because America is, is distracted um, and America is preoccupied. Um, and even if Joe Biden wins this election, um, it's, it's going to be a, a, you know, first of all, the, 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 we, we know now that there is a, there is, a, there is a Trumpist wing of, of the country, and we know that the possibility of reversion to that is always possible. And thank you very much indeed. I want to thank our sponsor, Scottish Mortgage Investment Trust, again. You can buy this book 
give a day of your life to reading it. It gives a very coherent account of what's happening in the democratic world. Uh, you can buy it in our online bookshop, the Edinburgh, Book Festival, Edinburgh International Book Festival online bookshop by clicking the button at the bottom of your screen. And if you've enjoyed this uh, session and other sessions in the book festival, then please, you might like to consider making a donation. We want to come roaring back next year and we will need your support to do that. Thank you to all of you at home for joining us and for staying with us. Most of all, thank you very much for a fascinating hour to Anne Applebaum. Thank you, Anne. Thank you.